Amen. So keep your place in Jeremiah chapter 6. That's going to be our, our text for this morning's sermon. We're going to be coming um, back to it. So we're going to go to other places in the Bible, but always just put a bookmark in Jeremiah chapter 6. That is going to be what we're studying this morning. So for this morning's sermon, we've been, our soul winning ministry has kind of moved into, into some, some nicer neighborhoods and some nicer areas of Fresno. And from time to time, we're going to be doing this. We're going to be going from, you know, different types of neighborhoods. And you're going to notice that there's a difference in, you know, receptiveness to where we end up going, depending on the neighborhoods that we go to. And this morning, um, I'd been thinking about this for the last uh, several weeks, but this morning, I want to talk to you about this problem that we see today. And this problem before you think, you know, that it's, you know, it's just me that's seeing this problem, this problem that we're seeing out there um, as far as receptiveness and soul winning. Um, let me just say that, you know, there is no new problems, first of all, in the world. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. There's no new problems. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, the Bible tells us this. And so what we're seeing today, as far as, you know, certain people not being receptive to the Word of God or to the Gospel, it is nothing new. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse number 9. Look at Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 9. The Bible says, The thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done, that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. So one, you know, one cool thing is that anything that we see today is nothing new that has happened before in the history of the world. It's a pattern that's repeated itself through time. And if you get anything from Bible studies on Wednesday nights and things like that is, is that you should see that there's patterns that are just coming up again and again with um, you know, the children of Israel, with God's people, and with all people in general. But most of all these patterns are documented in the Bible. And the Bible tells us how to deal with them. And the pattern I want to discuss and the problem that I want to discuss this morning is something that we've been seeing more than usual um, in this church, especially as we go do the first works, we go out soul winning, we um, carry the gospel <clears throat> to our community, is this. This is the problem that I want to discuss. Why doesn't anyone care about eternity? Why doesn't anyone care about their eternal destination? I mean, look, I mean, I can tell you for sure that, yes, this is nothing new under the sun, but I can tell you for sure I'm really good at recognizing trends. I'm not good at everything, but I'm good at recognizing trends. And I'm telling you that this trend in our local area about people just not caring about eternity has definitely gotten worse over the last year. And you have probably maybe, you know, seen this as well. I mean, but it makes perfect sense when you think about it, when you think about some of the things that have happened over the last year, just in our area, in our state, in our country. You know, I mean, people basically don't have to go to church anymore. People have, you know, been kept from church, you know, not us, but, you know, people in general have been told not to go to church. Many of them probably didn't like going to church anyway, so they had a nice excuse to not go to church, you know, and they don't even seem to consider the thought of eternity anymore. Because at least if you were going to church, you know, whether whatever kind of church you were going to, at least that puts some sort of focus on, you know, your life past, you know, this earth. Or your life, you know, past just the life that we're living in the flesh. But most people today, you know, they don't even consider the thought anymore. When you ask them, you know, where do you go to church? You know, most people, it's normal to hear now, well, oh, we, we haven't gone to church for a long time. Or we used to go here or whatever, but, you know, we just haven't gone for a long time. I mean, it's pretty bad. I mean, like, just think about this for a second. It's pretty bad when you have a society that can basically, you know, be told by the government and TV on how they should behave. But that is exactly what is going on. I mean, there's a main reason for not watching TV right there. It's just, it's changing who people are. You know, this, this media, I mean, look, it's literally stealing the fear of the Lord from people and putting it on, you know, things in this world. That's what, you know, media TV is doing. I can literally tell how much TV people consume or how much media people consume by, you know, just this point right here. I mean, look, if you, just think about this for a second. You think, how am I affected by media or how am I affected by the TV? How different are you um, today than you were a year ago? 
Just do that little test on yourself. If you say, no, I'm, I'm not different, I'm still doing exactly what I was doing um, a year ago, then you're probably more focused on the things of God than the things of this world. You know, the media, the TV, all this stuff. But look, but the big one here, the big one, salvation. I mean, think about this. Salvation, eternity. Most people still have a conscience out there. Most, most people are not, you know, rejected by God. You know, thank God that most people aren't. But look, they know they're not going to live forever and they will go somewhere when they die. Most people know this. So the question is, why don't people care? You know, why don't people care today? Why don't people care when you ask them if they want to know where they're going for eternity and they just don't care? Just on a logical level, you would think more people would care. You know, the fact that they still have that law written in their heart, they still have a conscience that's at least somewhat intact. So that's what I want to look at this morning. I want to look at, you know, some reasons this morning that people don't care. I want to show you some reasons that, you know, not only we are dealing with, but the prophets have dealt with, that other um, soul winners in the past have dealt with. But I want to give you reasons this morning, three specific reasons from Jeremiah chapter 6, on why people at the door ha will have zero interest. Some people. Jeremiah dealt with the same thing. Look at Jeremiah chapter 6. In Jeremiah chapter 6, he was dealing with this exact same thing that we are dealing with today. Look at Jeremiah chapter 6, and look at verse number 10. Look what the Bible says here. It says, To whom shall I speak and give warning, that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. I mean, if, you, if you're a soul winner, you felt like this before. You felt like this. You're like, these people, they just, you've gone soul winning, and you've knocked 60 homes, or you've knocked 40 homes, or 80 homes, or whatever the map is, and no one had any interest, and that's exactly what Jeremiah is saying right here. It's just that they, they have no delight in the Lord. Nobody wants to hear anything. Their ears can't hear. What's going on with these people? But then he gives, you know, the Bible gives us some explanation. Therefore, am I full of, fear, full of the fury of the Lord? I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days, and their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. When they were ashamed, and they had, where, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall, and at the time that I will visit them they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. So here in Jeremiah chapter 6 you have a very frustrated prophet. You have a very frustrated prophet. In verse number 10, he basically says, these people don't want to hear anything that I am telling them. Nothing. So this morning I want to give you three reasons that people don't care about eternity. The first answer, the first reason I want to give you is in the first part of verse number 13. I like to call this reason, you know, thorns. Look at Jeremiah 13 and look at the first part of this verse. The Bible says in Jeremiah 6, 13, For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them. This means everybody. He's saying, he's saying the poor people, even to the rich people in this country, are just obsessed with what? He's saying they're given to covetousness. They're obsessed with things, money, worldly items. These people are just wrapped up in the things of this world. Look, we see the exact same thing today. You will find people in the United States and you will find people that have a lot of money obsessed with money. But then you will find people that have no money obsessed with money. It doesn't even matter how much money you actually have. You'll find people that are just obsessed with it. It doesn't make a difference. And that's what he's saying here. People are just wrapped up in the things of this world. That is what's going on out here. People are wrapped up in making money. They are wrapped up in you know, cars. I mean, we were just talking about this yesterday. Like, it's just, 
I can't even explain what's happening in the economy in California right now. It, it's, it's, it's like this antithesis of logic and reason. It's weird. Everyone's buying cars. There is no cars. You know, I thought the economy was bad, but then everyone's just spending, 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 borrowing, borrowing, borrowing. But everyone's just obsessed with it. Everyone's just obsessed with it. I mean, it seems like nothing can stop the economy here. It seems like it. But, you know, something will stop it at some point. Turn to Matthew chapter 19. So look, that's one reason right there that people just have no interest in eternity is because they're obsessed with stuff. And, you know, money and making, you know, worldly possessions. You say, that, does that, that doesn't make sense to not even worry about it, but that, it blinds them. They're completely blinded to eternity. Look at Matthew chapter 19 and verse 24. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 19, verse 24, and I say, and again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to look at a few verses here. But the Bible says, you know, that being obsessed with worldly things can be an impediment to your salvation, to someone getting saved. That's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 19, 24. He's saying, look, somebody that's just got all these possessions and is just wrapped up with all these thorns of the world, the Bible will call it in the parable of the sower, you know, it's going to be very difficult for that person to, you know, get into the kingdom of heaven, for them to get saved. So that's what the Bible is talking about in Matthew 19, 24. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and look at verse number 23. Now this is talking about us right here. 1 Corinthians 1, 23. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, underline which are called. I'm going to explain that just as a side note here. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. That means God is so strong that you know even His weakness is stronger than anything that we have. Even God's even God's foolishness, it's just a, it's, a, it's not saying God's foolish, it's saying even the lowest thought God has is higher than any thought that the wisest person could have. Look at verse 26. For see your calling, brethren, that, that how many, that, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now called here, let me explain this. Called here in this passage means if, if you heard the word, and you listen to the word and you got saved, you're called. That, that's what the definition of called is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But God, just to, to you know, dis, dis, dismay all that Calvinistic um, teaching that comes from these types of words, but called, called means hearing and responding. Hearing and believing is what called means. So it says that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Look, not many of these types of people hear the word and believe the word. That's what the Bible is saying here. Look at verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. Here's what God is saying here. Here's what God is saying here. He's saying, because of the way salvation is designed, because of the way salvation is designed by belief alone, that you must humble yourself and put your trust completely in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that design, the base things of the world meaning the immoral things of the world, the sinful things of the world, you know, the, the foolish things of the world, your cars, your houses, all these things people are obsessed with, those things will confound the gospel for people. That's what the Bible is saying here. Because of the way that, that salvation is designed by, by that requirement that you must trust all in Jesus, these things will confound that, is what the Bible is saying. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Because look, 
If I could be saved by how awesome I am or how much stuff I had, which seems silly to even say that, but if I could be saved by even just a little bit, a little bit of my own doing or, you know, anything that I could possibly do or say or whatever, then I could glory. That th then this flesh would have something to glory in. But Jesus here is saying, the Bible here is saying, is that, you know, these things will confound the gospel. It will confound the gospel. It's geared, it's geared, and this matches up with Matthew 19, 24. This is why, this is why the gospel is geared towards the meek. It is geared towards the humble. Now, can you be a rich man and be humble? Yes, that's possible, but you don't usually see it. Okay, it's not the norm. Okay, the foolish things of this world will confound people to the point where they won't believe the gospel. We see this all the time. We see this all the time. Look, we are out there. We are out there, and we are calling. We are calling everybody. We're calling. We're knocking. We're, we're asking. We're asking the noble. We're asking the wise. They're just not going to answer. So they're not going to be. So we're calling. They're not going to listen. So therefore, they're not going to be the called. Does that make sense? That's what this verse, these, these passages are talking about here. But look, why aren't they going to answer? Because they're confounded with the foolish things of this world. They're confounded with the base things of this world. But look, it's their choice to be confounded by those things. That's what you have to remember. They are wrapped up in the foolish things, verse 27. They're wrapped up in the base things, verse 28. Base meaning, you know, without morality. Base meaning, you know, sin. They're wrapped up in sin. Look, sin, you know, stopping sinning is not going to get you saved, but being wrapped up in sin could confound you from believing the gospel. We met a guy like, I'm pretty sure we met a guy like this on Wednesday. I was with Brother Frank, and I kind of mentioned something. I don't know if Brother Frank knew um, exactly. I didn't get into detail explaining it, but we met this young man, and he kind of popped his head around the door and seemed like a super nice guy. Super nice guy, and Brother Frank was talking to him. He's like, I could, I could explain it to you. Super sincere guy, but you just had this feeling that he was just, he was wrapped up in that moment with something that he shouldn't have been wrapped up in. You just kind of had this feeling that whatever he was doing, you know, behind the door, you know, uh, you know, as he peeked his head around the door, you know, was just kind of keeping him from listening to what Brother Frank had to say. And, I, and it was so obvious that I mentioned something to Brother Frank. That, you know, because I mean, I thought maybe, maybe this kid would listen. You could tell, sincere kid, nice kid. And, but just some, you know, so look, being wrapped up in sin can definitely keep you from wanting to hear the truth. You know, turning from that sin is not going to save you. But being wrapped up in the base things of the world may very well keep you from becoming the called. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is talking about. Look, if Calvinism, if Calvinism, this idea, this, this dumb idea that's not, that you can't logically put together in the Bible, if it were true, then we would not, first of all, we would not be required to preach the gospel to all. Which is why a lot of, you know, most Calvinists don't go soul winning, by the way. Because it's God's, you know, God picks them. God picks them. What are we, what are we doing? But no, folks, God uses us to call all. We're calling all. These people have confounded themselves. With this first thing where, you know, these people wrapped up in covetousness. Look, if you believe in free will, you cannot believe in Calvinism. They do not go together. And how could you possibly believe the right gospel of, you know, belief alone on Jesus Christ because that is, that's the definition of free will. Your belief is completely yours. It's the one thing that you freely have that's all yours. They just don't go together, folks. So, your own sin also, those baser things, can stop you from being the called. We see here, the Bible's teaching that the foolish things of the world, the base things, sin, can keep you from believing the gospel. God has nothing to do with causing you to sin. That is your choice. That is your free will. Or to get into covetousness, by the way. These are choices that people make. And the reason that you will, one of the reasons that you will find 
that people have no interest in eternity is because they have chosen to be wrapped up in sin. They have chosen to be wrapped up in covetousness and, it, and it's blinded their eyes. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 6. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 6. I'll give you a second reason. A second reason, or maybe a third, because we looked at, we looked at um, covetousness, we looked at baser things, sin. Let's look at a, a third reason. Look at the second part of verse 13 in Jeremiah chapter 6. The second part of verse 13. Look what the Bible says. We'll read the whole verse. For the, from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. We talked about that. And then look at this reason. And, and from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. And then in verse number 14, the Bible says, they have healed. How did, how did they deal falsely? Because they have healed also the hurt of my daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. So they, what they've done is, these people dealing falsely, these men dealing falsely, they've gone and they've, they've made the people feel a little better here. It tells them. It said, they've made the people, they've healed them slightly. By that he means, they, they've made them, you know, they've, they've kind of told them what they wanted to hear and made them feel better temporarily, saying, peace, peace. I mean, that sounds good, right? Peace, peace. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're worried about stuff. Peace. No, peace. You're really worried about, you know, wrath and, and terrible things and consequences and chastisement. No, 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 no. Peace. Peace. There's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to worry about. That's what people want to hear. But the problem is this. They're saying that and there is no peace. They're saying that and God is mad. God is full of wrath. They're telling people things that are not true is what it comes down to. Men, turn to Ezekiel chapter, chapter 11. Now we could go on and on and on and on with Bible verses on this one. I'll just give you one more in Ezekiel chapter 11. Look at verse number 1. This is a constant pattern you see with the prophets. The prophets that are coming in and they're warning the nation. There's like, judgment is coming. God is angry. God is angry for this reason and this reason and this reason and all these wicked things that you've been doing. And there's always these, these other people that are coming in and saying, no, 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 no. God's not mad. God's not mad at all. These are men that are dealing falsely. Look at Ezekiel 11.1. 1. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh eastward. And behold, at the door of the gate of five and twenty men, whom I saw, Jazaniah, the son of Azur, and Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, princes of the people. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel in the city. And what is that wicked counsel? Which say, it is not near. Let us build houses. The city is the cauldron and we be the flesh. Look at what these men say. Je uh, Ezekiel is out there and he's preaching judgment. He's like, God's going to destroy this nation. God is going to wipe this nation off the earth. He's like, this is going to be terrible. He's like, this is going to be terrible. And these men are, no, 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 no. No. It is, no, judgment is not near. Judgment is not near. Build houses. Buy cars. Go, you know what will make you feel better? You're, you're feeling so stressed out, go buy yourself a new pickup. He's like, go, just go. And, I mean, we are, we are the, you know, the city is the cauldron, and we are the flesh in this pot. I mean, look, I mean, they, they were the, it was the cauldron, and they were the flesh, and the water was boiling already. And they didn't realize it. This is the, this is the proverbial frog in the, in the boiling pot right here. And guess what? It's us. It's us too. But these people are like, no, everything's fine. They're preaching the exact opposite. They're, they're lying. They're lying to the people. They're saying, peace, peace, and there is no peace. I mean, how many times have you heard that? How many times have you heard that? I mean, I, mean, I don't. I mean, how many, how many times have you heard that at the door? I don't believe in a God that would, I mean, you believe in this magic, magic sky being that would throw us all in hell? I mean, what? Why, why would you believe that? I mean, so first of all, let me, let me explain something from, from Romans 1 and Romans 2 that we studied through. We know for sure that everybody started with a conscience that knows that God exists. Everybody can see what? Everyone can see, you know, we have two things. We all start, I don't care if you're the most wicked, reprobate, rejected person at this moment in your life. Everybody started with a conscience and everybody started with a view of creation around them. 
with evidence that God is there. You have to be taught otherwise. And this is what Jeremiah chapter 6 is saying, is that men are out there teaching otherwise. You say, what? That's happening today? How about the public school? I mean, what are they teaching? God doesn't exist. They're teaching God doesn't exist. You're an animal, like all the other animals. You came from animals. You're just another, you know, link in the chain of animals. You know, God is not your father. The earth is your mother. It's, that's what they teach. That's what they're teaching. Why do you think we're like, you know, you have to homeschool your kids? If there's no option. They're literally teaching in so many different brilliant ways, it would shock you that there is no God. That, you know, that not only is there no God, but here's the explanation of how it, how it all happened, and they teach all these other wicked philosophies. Look, there is no absolute truth. There's no absolute, because if there's no God, there's no absolute truth, folks. I mean, more on, I mean, more on this uh, later, but you know, everything you feel or see is okay. Look at the verse of the week. Everything that, you, that comes in front of your eyes or you feel as good is fine, if that's what you think. That's what they're teaching. That's what they're teaching. No God, no absolute truth, anything goes. Is that not what you're seeing today? So, I mean, th there's, there's the no God right there. How about this one, though? False churches preaching a false God. Because, I mean, the devil's plan A is like, hey, there's no God. You're your own God. That's plan A. But he's like, okay, some people aren't buying that one. Some people have the Bible. He's like, all right, uh, false God. We'll twist the Bible. We'll, what, what are we seeing from Galatians? We'll pervert the gospel. We will take what God wrote and we will twist it and change it. And people will believe it. God is love. There is no wrath. People have literally been convinced, and you will meet these people out soul winning, that they, they have created their own God. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. They fear nothing. They fear nothing from God. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and look at verse number 11. But we know different, and that's why we're there. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 11. Look what we know. Look what we know. I mean, people, I, I don't believe, you know, maybe they believe in a God, but they believe in a God where, you know, do you think anybody would go to hell? No, I'm pretty sure that God will forgive everybody. You ever met these people? They're everywhere. All you have to do is ask for forgiveness. What if I never ask for forgiveness? I think God will forgive you anyway. I mean, you take their own, you take their own weird gospel that they believe, and you say that, okay, you violate your own weird workspace gospel, and they're just kind of like, yeah, but, you know, God is just, you know, He's not going to send people to hell. I don't believe in hell. There's just different levels of heaven. It's like a hotel. And, you know, it's just all kinds of weird, made-up God stuff. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 11. But what do we know? Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust are made, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Look, we know the terror of the Lord. We know, we know the wrath that is upon people that are not saved. We know that. So therefore, for that reason, we go and we try to persuade people. I mean, you ever been, you ever been at the door and you're just like, you can tell that maybe they're just on the edge and you're just like, how could I? That, that's why the better people person you can be, the, the, more, the more comfortable you can be talking with people. Look, it's one thing to be able to give the gospel. But look, we're really out there persuading people. And the better, you know, the, the better of a, you know, the better at connecting with people and the more in tune you are, with different people and different scenarios, the better soul winner you, were, you will be. Because we're there to persuade people. We're there to persuade people to listen. Look, we're out there and we're advocating for people's own souls. We're at their door because we're, at, we're trying to beg them to care about themselves. We're trying to beg them to care about their own families. Hey, could you please care about your own children, please? We're trying to persuade them. 
I mean, we will walk away from people and we will just be like, what could I have possibly said better? And I know that there's things that I could say better to people. I know that I can get better at this. I know that I can get better at persuading people. That's why, you know, you just need to, you need to take every individual person as, as an individual person and, and just, how can I persuade this person? Because that's what we're doing. Because we know that God is not just this, you know, I just love everything all the time and everybody's going to heaven. No, most people are going to hell, Jesus said. We know the terror of the Lord, folks. We know the terror of God's judgment. So we're out there, we're advocating for people. Turn to Zephaniah chapter 1. Zephaniah chapter 1. This is another one. We could just read Bible for 10 hours, 11 hours on the wrath of God. There's a lot of wrath in this book. If you're saying, I don't know, you know, is, does God have wrath? Well, you, are, you have not opened the King James Bible. Look at Zephaniah chapter 1. This is God. Zephaniah chapter 1. And look at verse number 12. Look at verse number 12 of Zephaniah chapter 1. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with their candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees. These are men that are just, they're just back and they're just relaxing. That they say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. What does that mean? These people are sitting back and they're relaxed and they're saying, you know what? God doesn't care what's going on down here. God's not going to do good to us. He's not going to do bad to us. It's like, God, that, that's how I know. That's how I know, by the way. This should give you great faith right here because this here is saying that God is the opposite of this. So personally, for your own personal faith, just remember, God's plugged into this thing. God is in this game. God is in control of everything. And look, He will do good and He will do evil, meaning hurt, meaning He will judge. And these people were sitting back and they're saying, God's not, He's not... He's not in this thing. He doesn't care what we do. Look at verse 13. Therefore, and this is interesting, therefore their goods shall become a booty. What are one of the things that people, is keeping people from being saved? Their goods, their covetousness, and their houses a desolation. Jeremiah chapter 6 goes into this same thing. They shall also build houses, but not inhabit them. So all these people from Ezekiel that were saying, no, it's fine. Build houses. There's nothing going on. We're the pot. We're the flesh. The city is the cauldron. We're the flesh. He's like, they'll build houses and then, you know, somebody else is going to live in them. All their stuff is going to be somebody else's. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth, hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty men shall cry there bitterly. The strongest men in the city will be weeping. That day, well, well, what does that mean? Maybe they're weeping because they lost their house. No, that day is a day of wrath. A day of trouble and distress. A day of wasteness and desolation. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities, against the high towers. And I will bring, because why? Because who's doing it? And I will bring distress upon them. They that shall walk shall be like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as dung. Have a nice day. I mean, that is wrath right there. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. God is jealous. God is jealous. Jealous is a good thing. Jealousy means, you know, wanting something that's yours. God was jealous of his people. He was jealous. You can be jealous of your wife because she's yours. She belongs to you. A husband and wife belong to each other. That jealousy is good. Envy is something different. Envy is wanting something that's not yours. But God is jealous of you. And when you go start chasing after all these other things, especially to the point where, you know, people are not getting saved because they've made idols of all these other things, look, God will destroy your idols. And that's what he's doing here. People have been convinced by evil men, this is the second thing, that either God doesn't exist or the devil's plan B, that he doesn't care, that he's not involved, that he's, that he's not this God, that he's some sort of different God. 
So they have no fear of the, of the true God. I mean, this is, a scary, this is a scary bunch of verses if you're not saved. That's a scary bunch of verses even if you are saved and you're in sin. That's a scary bunch of verses. They have no fear of the true God. This, this was, we talked about, somebody preached about this. Brother Frank, this is what happened in Josiah's time. There was no fear of the true God. They had some sort of God made up in their mind. And then they read the Bible, and they read the Bible, and they're like, oh, this is really what God is? They're like, oh, man. And, and look, we need more moments like that. We need more Josiah moments. You'll see this. Look, you'll see this with people that just get saved, and then, you know, or, or just have not been in church, and then they get in a Bible preaching church, and they listen to stuff like this, and they're just like, they're, it's like, their hair's like, it's like they're going in a car like 100 miles an hour. They're just like, whoa. Yeah, but that's, that's God, and He's not changed. It's just men dealing falsely. Men not preaching the Bible. Men having church and not preaching the whole Bible. Look, they've dealt falsely with people. So people have lost that fear of the Lord. Third reason, or maybe, what are we on, four? Fourth reason. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, or look at the front of your bulletin. The fourth reason that people won't get saved when you're out there and you're going soul winning and they won't even seem to have a care in the world about salvation is one word, youth. Youth. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 11 or verse number 9. The Bible says, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes, but know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. Here he is telling them at the beginning of verse number 9, he's like, walk in the ways of your heart. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 17. He's like, walk in the ways of your heart. Well, it sounds like, I mean, what's wrong with that? I mean, I mean isn't that what everyone tells you today? Follow your heart. Just follow your heart. I mean, follow your heart. You know, whatever, whatever you feel is right. You know, whatever you feel is the right thing to do. Right? Isn't this what they'll teach you? Isn't this what the world will teach you? Look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number 9. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number 9. The Bible says this. Uh-oh. It says the heart is deceitful. It's not only just deceitful, it's deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know, I don't know how many times I have seen people say, oh, I was, just, I was just following, you know, following my heart or following this. Look, how do I know if my heart is deceiving me? Because if it goes against what the Bible says, it's deceiving me. But here in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, somebody who was foolish, foolish in his youth is saying, hey, follow your heart, young man. He's like, follow your heart, youthful person. But look, the heart is deceitful amongst all things. He's saying that tongue in cheek and desperately wicked. And then he says, follow your sight. He's like, young man, can you imagine if this was actual advice you were giving a young person? He's basically saying, deny yourself nothing, young man. In short, what he's saying is here is that young people have foolish tendencies. You know, the teenager, the teenager has, maybe, you know, you've all been a teenager before, but the teenager has this inherent foolish tendency that says, you know what, I'll never die. I'll never die. I mean, eternity, why, I mean, why would I have to worry about eternity? I'm 18. I will never die. This is how young men think. I know, I used to be one. I, I, mean, God, I mean, God will bring me into judgment? I mean, these teenagers, they just, they're not focused on eternity because they're foolish. Because they're caught up in youthful lusts. That's what Ecclesiastes chapter 11, 9 is saying, that if you do that, young man, you will be brought into judgment. So look, those are, the, you know, those are three or four main reasons why you will find people. Don't be surprised. There's nothing new under the sun. Those are three or four main reasons that you'll find people out there today that just don't care about eternity. They just could care less. And you'll walk away as a Bible-believing Christian and you know, somebody that's in church three times a week and soul winning and you're growing in your faith and you just, it'll just be shocking to you. But it's not shocking because this is what the Bible says. They're wrapped up in covetousness. They're wrapped up in sin. You know, they're youthful, they have youthful lusts, and they've just been taught a bunch of wicked, false things. That's why. 
That's why. But guess what? All three of these things, all four of these things, they also apply to you. So let me just end the sermon by just applying these four things to you as well. And look, this is how soul winning can help you grow as a Christian. These things, all, every single one of them can apply to you. They're all dangers to you. It's not just about, oh yeah, these, these you know, unsaved people. Look, it's going to cost them eternity. But it could cost you your life on this earth. It could cost you, you know, your, your fruitfulness on this earth. Turn to Matthew chapter 13. This is what the parable of the sower is talking about. It's talking about a lot of these same things in the context of the believer. In the context of someone who's saved. Look at Matthew 13. And look at verse 22. The one that we discussed was the thorns. He that also receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and he go to hell. No, it chokes the word, and he becomes unfruitful. He gets backslidden. He cares about nothing but things of this world, and making money, and cars, and houses, and all these things. Look, you're not going to lose your salvation, but you're going to bear no fruit. You're going to all of a sudden, when you care about those things, look, you can only care about one thing. You can only have your heart, you can only have, you know, your spirit in one place. It can only be in one place. It can't be in two. So you will stop caring about the spiritual things. You will stop wanting the spiritual things. And you will start wanting and hungering more for those worldly things. And it will choke you out. It will choke you out. The second one also applies. Men leading others astray. Men leading, you know, dealing falsely. I'm not going to get deep into this tonight because we're going to talk about this one this evening when I talk about separation. But you say, what, believers? Yes, believers can lead you astray. Believers can lead you astray. I'm going to park this one here because we're going to just, we're going to deep dive this one tonight. Believers can, you know, many people think that, oh, if I get somebody saved, everything's all good. That's all that matters. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. This is absolutely not the case. We'll talk about that this evening. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. But youth, let me talk about the youth. Let me rip on the young people for a few minutes, and then we'll be done this morning. But 2 Timothy chapter 2, look what the Bible says. Look, youthful lusts and foolishness in youth also affects the saved. It's not like I'm a young person and I get saved and all of a sudden I just have to I worry about nothing anymore. I'm fine. Like, no, Ecclesiastes chapter 11 applies. 2 Timothy chapter 2, look what the Bible says in verse 22. The Bible says, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. It's saying, look, flee youthful lusts and, and pursue all these godly things with people that are pursuing these things. So it's saying that youthful, that youth should follow people that are following faith, charity, and peace. You know what it's saying? It's saying young people need guidance is what it's saying. Because they have all these lusts that go against what's good for them. They have they have this heart. These young people, they have this heart that is telling them that they want something and it's not what they should have. They have these eyes that are telling them that, you know, um, I want these things and it's not what the Bible says that they should have. I mean, I'm gonna, let me throw the, the young people in our church under the bus for a few minutes. Yesterday, yesterday at the barbecue, uh, nobody was, was, had arrived yet except for three or four young people. I won't name any names. But I, I was just uh, getting things together and putting things together for the barbecue. And one, the lemon tree had dropped a lemon. I picked it up off the ground and I was going to throw it away. And I just threw it up in front of the young guys sitting around the table. And I was like, we're going to have a lemon eating contest. So you can eat this lemon, the whole thing, as fast as possible. I mean, I was joking, right? I was joking. And then, you know, we went around, uh, you know, we went, you know, through the day, and a lot of the guys came over, and you know, the guys, they came over, and we're discussing, we're discussing politics, we're discussing world events, economics. I just like to sit and just, just talk and just fellowship about these things. And then after most people had left, the teenagers were still around, and I went in the house, and I was putting some things together in the house, and I'm hearing through the wall, the teenagers are having a lemon-eating contest in the backyard. They're eating lemons 
the whole thing. And then after that, after that, they decided that, oh, well, what should we do next? What do you want to do next, wise teenager? Oh, well, wise teenager, let's have a belly flop contest. So, you know, you have the men, you know, talking about their jobs and, you know, you know th business and you know, things of the world, you know, things, how, how we're going to, you know, take care of the, this and the, maybe some things of the church. And you have the teenagers, you know, making themselves sick and inflicting physical pain on themselves <laughs> for fun. Now look. <laughs> amen. Amen. No, 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 amen, amen, and here's why. Because that's the importance of church, because if you're going to be foolish, let's be foolish in, in silly, harmless ways. Amen. Okay? And it is funny, and I'm just, I'm using it as, a, as an example. There's nothing wrong with any of those things that happened yesterday. But the point is that teenagers need counsel. Teenagers need counsel. You didn't see a bunch of 50-year-olds doing belly flops yesterday. <laughs> Okay? You didn't see, you know, uh, Brother Ryan and I sitting there and seeing who could eat the most lemons, including the peel. I mean, what in the world? I mean, I've never even heard of anything like that. Is that possible? Apparently, it will not kill you because they're here today. <laughs> but the point is this. The point is this. In 1 Kings chapter 12, verse number 8, it, it's the importance of church, first of all. It's the importance of wise guidance. And look, teenagers, let me just say this in all seriousness, in your life, in your life, you will have counsel. You have the teenagers here, I, I, I attest to this, you have wise counsel available to you. You have wise counsel available to you. Defer to that counsel. Don't pack up amongst yourselves and say, we're a bunch of teenagers and we know what's best you know, for us, look at 2 Kings chapter 12 and verse, or 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse number 8, because this is what Rehoboam did. He packed up with his buddies, but he forsook, forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given to him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, and they said, let's eat a bunch of lemons, and which stood before him. Look, young people, I'll just say this, I'll just say this, young people that aren't asking for counsel are in danger especially in this world. I mean, look, you have counsel available to you if you are part of this church. Ask for it. Get guidance. You have a lot of counsel here. Use it. Use it. And like I said, the things yesterday, I'm joking, nothing at all wrong with those things. It was just a, an example I was using. But please, use the tools, teenagers, that God has given you. God has given you wise counsel and guidance and a good church and the Bible. Just use it. Just use it. Use the tools God's given you. So in conclusion, folks, this morning, there's nothing new under the sun. Don't let these types of things get you down. Think about the prophets. Think about Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Think about these men, Zephaniah. Think about what these men went through. Many of these men went through, you know, they were killed. They were persecuted. They were physically, you know, harmed. But when you see this apathy out souling, it's just because of covetousness, it's because of sin, it's because of false teaching, and it's because of youthful lust. That's what it is for. And these things are things that we also need to guard ourselves against. But this is why, because all these things, this is, look, the covetousness, the sin, the false teaching, the youthful lust, that's what you're up against. That's what you're trying to persuade through. It's interesting, it'll make you more persuasive, by the way, you know, if you know what you're up against. You know, when you find out, when you're talking to somebody and you realize, you know, maybe what their issue is, it'll help you become a better soul winner and help you persuade people in a more effective way. But remember these things for yourself as well. Because just because you're saved doesn't mean you can't fall into temptation and snares. You know, it happens all the time. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.